So here in lecture 7.2, we're going to continue our discussion of extracting common divisors from multi-level logic represented in the algebraic model. In the previous lecture, we showed the simple case for how to extract a single cube divisor. What we're going to show in this lecture is how we extract the more complicated case of a multiple cube divisor. And one of the nice things that we're going to find is that it looks just about exactly the same in that we are again going to build a big matrix and attempt to cover it. And so one of the nice things about these methods is that they are nicely reminiscent of Carnot maps, which we all know and love. So let's go look at how we pull out multiple cube divisors from complicated multi-level logic. We'd like to now go look for the multiple cube divisors. Um, remarkably, a very similar matrix rectangle prime concept still works. We're going to make an appropriate matrix. We're going to find a prime rectangle. We're going to do some literal count of bookkeeping with the numbers associated with the rows and columns, and it all just works. It's really very nice. It's a nice kind of unifying idea. Um, but I need a new set of examples. I need a little more complicated set of examples in order to find some interesting multiple cube divisor. So here are my functions. P is AF plus BF plus AG plus CG plus ADE plus BDE plus CDE. Q is AF plus BF plus ACE plus BCE. R is ADE plus CDE. So you should not be surprised that the first step is I need to go find the co-kernels and kernels of each of these functions. Why is this? We have this big powerful theorem, Brayton McMullen, which says multiple cube factors are intersections of the product terms in the kernels for each of these functions. So what you can think of is that we're going to be putting this matrix structure together that lays out in one nice, pretty simple way all of this interesting, deep kernel, co-kernel architecture of a complicated Boolean logic network in a way such that a prime rectangle identifies what we're looking for in terms of a nice divisor. So let's just go look at that. So um, here's a very complicated slide that is simply all of the kernels and all of the co-kernels of our PQR example. And uh, this is pulled from uh, Rick Rudell's PhD thesis from way back when, uh, from UC Berkeley in 1989. P, AF plus BF plus AG plus CG plus ADE plus BDE plus CDE. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six real kernels. So, for example, co-kernel A has kernel DE plus F plus G. Co-kernel B has kernel DE plus F. Co-kernel DE has kernel A plus B plus C, and so on. You can, you can simply read the lines. Um, I'll note that, you know, technically, if you divide this thing by co-kernel 1, you get a kernel that's the function back, and since the function is itself cube-free, that's a perfectly legitimate kernel, but it's not an interesting or useful one, so we're going to ignore it. Similarly, Q, which is AF plus BF plus ACE plus, B, plus BCE, it has two interesting co-kernels. If you divide it by A or you divide it by B, you get kernel CE plus F. And so I'll note here that, um, you know, you can have more than one co-kernel when you divide it with algebraic division, you, you get the same kernel. And co-kernel F or co-kernel CE also makes A plus B that kernel. And so we have exactly the same concept. And again, there's a co-kernel 1. If you divide it by that, you get the function Q back. Q is cube free, so we'll ignore that one. And then R is ADE plus CDE. It's only got one interesting co-kernel DE and one kernel A plus C. And R is not its own kernel. Why not? Because R is not cube free. If you go look at it, it's got a DE in both terms. So those are all the co-kernels and all the kernels. That's the sort of the raw material of this matrix that I want to go build. So what's the matrix? The matrix is called the co-kernel cube matrix. And, and here's the way you put it together. So it has one column for each unique cube among all the kernels in the problem. So it has columns that are labeled A, B, C, C, E, D, E, F, and G. Those are columns 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, respectively. And the key idea here is that this is sort of the raw material for the multiple cube divisors that we're looking for. And the other interesting and important idea here is that I only need one um, um, sample, if you will, 
from every unique cube in the kernel. So for example, um, DE appears up here in one of the kernels for P, and DE appears in a different kernel for P, DE plus F plus G, it appears in DE plus F, it appears in, and it also appears in yet another kernel for P, uh, DE plus G. But nevertheless, despite the fact that there are three places that it appears, um, this stuff only appears in one column. I only need to know that it's there. I don't need to know that there are three of them there on the columns. I will track this information actually in the rows. Now, what are the rows? There is one row for each unique function co-kernel pair. So, for example, um, I've got a little highlight here that says P has a co-kernel C. And so there is a row that says P, C. And so there are, in fact, 11 rows, P and A, row 1, P and B, row 2, P and D, E, row 3, P and F, row 4, P and C, row 5, P and G, row 6, Q and A, row 7, Q and B, row 8, Q and C, E, row 9, Q and F, row 10, R and D, E, row 11. And the one other thing that I will note is that um, if we look at just these two rows, Q with co-kernel F has a kernel A plus B, and Q with co-kernel CE has the same kernel A plus B, um, I will in fact list those twice, right? because those are different. In this particular example, those are different function co-kernel pairs. Right? So that's the structure of this matrix. A little more complicated than the single cube extraction, but you know, not too bad. And again, entirely mechanical. So let us answer the question, what goes in the individual row column entries here in the matrix? Um, and the answer is um, shown with some examples here. So from the row, you take the co-kernel, and then you go look at the associated kernel. So for example, if we take P, and co-kernel A, we get the kernel DE plus F plus G. So that's this my first example here. Then you look at the cubes in the kernel and you put ones in columns that are the cubes in this kernel. Otherwise, you put a dot. So for the row that says P, which has a co-kernel of A, you go and you put a one in column DE, column F, and column G. Similarly, if you take P and you divide it by co-kernel G, you get kernel A plus C. And so what you do is you have a row of the matrix that has a P and a G, that's row 6, and you put ones in just columns A and C and nothing else. And so if you simply read this matrix, you know, the P, B, row 2 has um, ones for D, E, and F because that's what the kernel is, it's D, E plus F. The P, D, E, row 3 has A plus B plus C as the rows, as the columns that are have ones in it. The PF row has A and B as the columns. The PC row has D, E, and G. The PG row has columns A and C. The QA row has columns C, E, and F. The QB row has columns C, E, and F. The QCE row has columns A and B. The QF row has columns A and B. And the RDE row has columns A and C. In effect, each row of this co-kernel cube matrix says, here's a function, P or Q or R. If I divide it by this co-kernel cube, and it's listed right next to the function name, that is the result I get. You can read the result I get right off the row. So you know, we just, just go back you know, to our example here. On the top row, P is a function. If I divide P by co-kernel A, what do I get? Answer. DE plus F plus G. I can just go read those things off. Okay, so the matrix is a little more complicated, but again, something that one can construct mechanically. So, as I said previously, the matrix exposes the full deep kernel co kernel architecture of a complicated network of Boolean logic nodes. Now, what? Well, um, a beautiful and wonderful thing happens, and that is that a prime rectangle defined in exactly the same way as in the single cube extraction case is again a good divisor. That's just a wonderful thing. And now you get a multiple cube. So here I am showing you in this um, same example from the same matrix a prime rectangle. And so the prime rectangle is columns A and B, columns 1 and 2, 
and rows P, D, E, that's row 3, rows P, F, that's row 4, row Q, C, E, that's row 9, and row Q, F, that's row 10. And there are ones at each one of those row and column intersections. And now, how do you create the multiple cube divisor? And the answer is that you OR the cubes together. And those are the cubes in your multiple cube divisor. And you can just see this. I'm showing you this example. The PDE row of the matrix says, look, P is equal to co-kernel DE ended with A plus B plus some other stuff that I don't care about. And oh, by the way, there's a remainder that I, I don't really care about at all. And the second row of the prime rectangle says that P is equal to co-kernel F ended with A plus B plus some other stuff, potentially. Actually, in this case, there isn't any other stuff if you would technically look at the matrix. Um, it says that Q is equal to CE ended with A plus B plus potentially some other stuff. Actually, there isn't any other stuff if we look at the matrix. And it says Q is also equal to F divided, uh, multiplied by A and B and possibly some other stuff. In this case, not so much, plus some other remainder. However, the one commonality of all of these things is that P and Q are all equal to A plus B ended with something ORed with a bunch of other stuff. So if you OR together the cubes that represent the columns of the prime rectangle, this is your divisor. And we can just go draw it. Here we are drawing it. The old network on the left, a very tiny picture of the prime rectangle covering the matrix in the middle, and the new network on the right. And so on the left we see C bubbles three bubbles which say exactly what the function was when we started. P is AF plus BF plus AG plus CG plus ADE plus BDE plus CDE. Q is AF plus BF plus ACE plus BCE. R is ADE plus CDE. Nothing new. What we have discovered from the prime rectangle is that A plus B is a factor. So let's just call it capital X. And so on the right-hand side, I've got a new little yellow node that says x equals a plus b, and that new node feeds a new p and a new q, but it does not feed a new r, so r still says ade plus cde. But p now says xde plus xf plus ag plus cg plus cde. That's that other stuff I was talking about. And q is now xce plus xf because the a, b, a plus b stuff has been pulled out. So p and q are actually smaller. If you count the literals in the original network on the left, there's 33 of them. Go ahead, do it. Just, you know, look at the right-hand side and count them all off. If you count them in the new network, again, everything on the right-hand side of an equals, and oh, by the way, you've got a new node there. There's an x there now. You will find it's 25, and I've saved eight literals, which is you know, a pretty nice example. And again, there's a formula. There's just some bookkeeping that you can use. If you know the rectangle, you can compute how many literals are saved. And the formula is just a little bit more complicated than it was before. So for each column C in the rectangle, let the weight of that column be the number of literals labeling the column cube. For each row in the rectangle, let the weight of the row be 1 plus the number of literals in the co-kernel labeling the row. Now, there's another one. For each one covered at the row R column C intersection, you want to and the co-kernel that labels the row with the column cube. That's actually the thing in the original network that you just discovered and replaced. Okay, so um, and the co-kernel row label and the column cube label, you're going to get a new product term. The value of that row column intersection is the number of literals in that new anded product. And then there's a formula, and the formula L for the number of literals saved is you add up the values of the ones that you're covered in the rectangle over all the rows in the columns, and then you subtract the sum of the row weights and you subtract the sum of the column weights, and L is the number of literals you save. Um, let's just go look to illustrate it. It's not really so complicated. So here we have at the top the before picture of the P, Q, and R network, just as from the previous slide. And on the bottom, we have the after network, which has an X node, a modified P node, a modified Q node, and the same R node. We've also got the, um, the, uh, the matrix shown with the prime rectangle illustrated. 
And now there's a bunch of little boxes next to the rows and the columns and the values that I'm just going to fill in. So um, what are the column weights? So remember, the column weights are just count the number of literals labeling the column. So the column weight of column 1 is 1 because there's just an A. And the column weight of column 2 is just 1 because it's just a B. Now the row weights are 1 plus the number of literals in the co-kernel. So row 3, which is P, co-kernel DE, has a weight of 3 because DE has two things in it. 1 plus 2 is 3. P divided by F, co-kernel F is row 4, that row weight is a 2. Um, and the reason that one is a 2 is because F just has one thing in it. Q row CE, uh, Q co-kernel CE row 9, that's also similarly a 3 for the same reason. Um, CE has two things in it, 1 plus 2 is 3. QF row 10, F has one literal in it, that co-kernel 1 plus 1 is 2. Right, so those are the row weights, 3 and 2, 3 and 2. Now, the values are, you go look at the ones that are being covered, so there's a cluster of four ones in the top two rows and a cluster of four ones in the bottom two rows, so I'm expecting four numbers on the top and four numbers on the bottom. And remember, what you do here is you and the co-kernel label on the row with the column cube label and you take the product that you get and you count the literals because that is really what you identified in the starting network and replace. So this is part of the accounting. So for the top left one, we have DE in row three and A in row in column one. DEA has three literals in it and so I get a three. Same row, column B, DEB also has three literals in it and so I get a three. Um, next, row 4, F has one literal in it for the co-kernel. F, A has two literals in it, so I get a 2. F, B has two literals in it, so I get a 2. So I get 3, 3, 2, 2. Um, and similarly, if I do the same um, analysis on the bottom, what I will find in the cluster of four ones associated with rows 9 and 10, um, C, E, and F respectively as the co-kernels, columns 1 and 2, A and B respectively as the cubes, I will get 3 and 3, 2 and 2. 3, 3 for the top row, 2, 2 for the bottom row. So if I take all of this information, I can now go compute what I'm interested in. What is the sum of the element values? It's the sum of 3 and 3 and 2 and 2 and 3 and 3 and 2 and 2. That's a 20. What is the sum of the row weights? Well, that's 3 and 2 and 3 and 2. That's 10. What's the sum of the column weights? That's 1 and 1. That's pretty simple. The value sum minus the row sum minus the column sum, 20 minus 10 minus 2 is 8. Hey, it works. That is, in fact, the number of literals saved. There were 33 literals, literals in this network when we started. There are 25 literals in this network when we have extracted this nice common divisor A plus B. 33 minus 25 is 8, and it all just works. Now, I need to give you one little, little bit of a detail um, that we're just not going to talk about um, in, in Lecture 7. You can extract a second divisor or a third divisor or a fourth divisor. You can do that for single cube divisors and you can do that for multiple cube divisors. But there's a bunch more bookkeeping to do that. And the big thing is that you actually have to update the matrix to reflect the fact that your logic in your Boolean network changed when you did this extraction. The stuff on the right hand side of the equal sign of some of your nodes changed. And you have a new node because you've actually divided something out. You've got to actually update the matrix. So because the node contents are different, and there's a new divisor node, and it's sort of like adding don't cares to a Carnot map. So it turns out there's some things that are no longer essential when you put the prime rectangles down. So it's like you get don't cares in the Carnot map that you can optionally cover or not cover. And for the multiple cube case, um, you actually have to kernel the new divisor, the thing that you extracted, 
um, the multiple cube divisor, you have to go kernel that and put its kernels and its co-kernels back in the matrix so that you actually can find the right new divisors. It's all entirely mechanical. It's a bit tedious, to be, to be very honest. And there's some special rules that happen for how the accounting and the bookkeeping happens for counting for the literals. And I'm just going to skip it. Um, it's just mechanical. I think for our purposes, it is entirely sufficient to know how to extract the good first divisor using the matrix that we find either for the single cube case or the matrix that we find for the multiple cube case. For us, this is good enough. So we know now that the deep structure of um, a multi-level design expressed using the algebraic model and expressed via appropriate extraction of all the kernels and the co-kernels can lead us to good single cube divisors and good multiple cube divisors. That's really pretty impressive. What we don't know yet is mechanically how you actually find the prime rectangle. So let's go do that next.